Hey Ash here, I wanna take this moment and introduce this case and thank you so much for being here. You know, this case is really interesting because the patient still had some sensation to her lower left molar even after the pulpectomy, which was completed nine months ago. Now, if you're new to endo and haven't had this situation, wait for it. It can be frustrating and this video might actually help you out. And I also wanna thank you for your support over the years and ask that if you like this material, please share it with your colleagues. I know what it's like to be at the beginning of my career and trying to figure out dentistry and that's why I'm still here years later making these videos. If you wanna learn more about a practical way to do endo that's affordable, check us out at allthingsendo.ca. And by the way, I have an advanced course coming. Let's jump into it. I wanna share this case because we did this about five years ago and I recently talked with the, case, with the patient and you know it's been successful. So I'm, I'm like, hey, listen, it worked out well and let's go ahead and talk about it. We're gonna finish the root canal here, but what's interesting about this case is the medial mesial canal. And I guess my interest is sparked because there's an article out in the Journal of Endodontics that talks about the middle mesial canal. And that link is in the description box below. This, so if we're into the tooth now, this is stage two. It has been actually nine months because the patient went on vacation, it's back to finish stage two, but between stage one and stage two, she said that she always had sensitivity to cold when her tooth was cold and became warm again. Really interesting, and I tested it, and it's so interesting because you'll see here she she can feel the sensation as the tooth is changing temperature. So I'm like, hmm. Right. So this is the mesial buckle. This is the mesial lingual canal, and look at the width on here. My experience has been there's gonna got to be an MB, uh, mes middle mesial. Now, is it for sure? I don't know. We don't have a cone beam. We just got regular radiographs. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my Munz burr, and I'm just going to trough on that white part. So the critical part, if you're doing this. This is at five times magnification. This is the furcation, pulpal floor, and this is kind of towards the mesial of the tooth. We really want to focus on keeping our burr on this part of the middle mesial. Um, it's complicated to do, and it's really hard to do. This patient was amazing because she was able to open wide. We have a bite block in. That's like a standard thing I use because these appointments go about an hour. And what I'm doing is I'm trying my best to stay on that white little shelf of dentin. Now, there's a number of articles that talk about in the Journal of Endodontics about middle mesial canals and whatnot. And in the late, latest article, the global prevalence it talks about is like 4% in first molars, 1% in second molars. I kind of go on the idea where an article before was, there's tons of them, like 15%. But really, what kind of made my spidey senses tingle is the fact that she had cold sensation changes, changes in cold sensation. Now that could be another tooth and that's why we redid the exam. And so after here, we've got all this debris. So here's our mesial buckle, here's our mesial lingual. I don't see anything that's really capturing my eye. I'm looking for a white line, but you never know. And got a couple other tips in this video as well. It's gonna talk about gutter percha fit. Uh, stay tuned for that. I'm gonna to try to keep this under like 30 minutes. I haven't done a long video for a while and I think it was time. So if you're here for the long road, I really appreciate it. So what we're gonna do here, so here's another little tip. This is the positive aspiration, or I'm just, it's called aspirating your irrigant. You know, you're essentially using your irrigating syringe as a, a vacuum. I'm suctioning it out. These are the distal canals, and you can see they join. And what I'm gonna do is, be, just to make it easier to obturate, but also to make sure that I have all the vital tissue, it's usually not vital by now, I'm gonna to try to remove this calcification as much as possible without interfering with the furcation. This is tedious work, and if you're, you know, you don't have to do this, I don't think it's critical. You can use an ultrasonic as well, but just for me to be able to confirm that I don't have anything underneath this, or they do, not so much they join, I'm pretty sure they join, but just to get a clear visualization uh, during the obturation process, I elected to remove just a little bit, a few millimeters, and then you'll see down the road, what I'm gonna use is my Wave on Gold, in a different type of fashion. As well, there's another calcification along the pulp chamber, and I was kind of wondering, it's a shot in the dark, trust me. Maybe there's a little bit of pulp tissue that's up here that's still surviving that may be giving that cold sensation. So I'm gonna remove that little bit of little calcification up here. Now, it's a shot in the dark, but I have seen cases, especially anterior cases, and I've retreated them where the initial, the initial provider two-stage process over two months and still those two anterior teeth. I actually have it posted somewhere here where those teeth were still sensitive to cold because 
the apical portion was not machined out large enough to remove all of the pulpal tissue. But if you can believe it, that pulp, those little nerve endings still were, they still survived after calcium hydroxide placement. It blew my mind. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use my sonic activator. And we're going to, so we've got, cal, we've got sodium hypochlorite 5% down the canals. And I'm going to use a sonic activator just to kind of remove, activate the irrigant and remove some of the calcium hydroxide. You know, the thing with endo is that there's a lot of art to it. And there's science, but there's also a lot of art. And one of the art things I don't know is like, do you need to remove absolutely all your calcium hydroxide from the canal? I don't think there's an answer to that. Certainly you'll see me machine the size of these canals a little bit larger to remove it, to remove the calcium hydroxide. It was initially machined to a 2507. So, but what I'll do is I'll use that activator to kind of remove, you know, activate all that irrigant and kind of clear it up remove some of that, as much calcium hydroxide as possible. So as you can see here, I'm doing that positive aspiration test, might be calling it wrong, from the mesial canals. So that's the distal, we know they join, we anticipate they join, we antici I'm anticipating the mesials join. So I'm doing that positive aspiration, I'm suctioning it out from one of the canals and you can see it, the, the irrigant reducing from the other canal. Now, and one of the things that is, has been really helpful in changing the game for me since I started See, I'm using forceps to place my files in the canals. It just seems to be so much easier. So I'll bend them slightly, and then I'll place them in, and then boom, I'll watch wind them down. And I'm not using the mirror because I have straight line access into each of the canals. So now we're going to clean and shape. So I'm going straight to the, whoop, going straight to the medium. So we're going to clean and shape our canals. It's pretty straightforward. Get back and focus. And we're running down the mesial buckle right now. I'll pull it out. I'm looking for debris. So two things what we do is I'm looking for debris, but I'm also looking to see if my file is intact and not fractured, separated. And what you'll do there, so when I mean straight line axis, that file can go straight down, boom, in. I have a little bit of a curve. We're going to run all the working lengths are 18. So what I'm looking for here is a little bit of debris. Not bad. And that usually means that I'm done shaping. So this is stage two, it's usually pretty quick. Because the patient was feeling, I think it was because I was the patient was feeling sensitivity to cold, I wanted to make sure that we had removed all that apical tissue. So what I elected to do is to open all those apical portions to the 45, knowing, anticipating that they join and making sure we don't have any cold sensitivity because I want predictability. I don't want, I don't want to operate and have the patient come back. What I did was I elected to open up to 4505 but put in the comments below, you know, your thoughts. I'm sure, you know, you might think this is a little bit large, but I'm not getting any debris. The other thing is, is I didn't get any debris from the mesial canals, and that was my concern. So that is pretty much the reason why I went to a 4505 on those mesials, because there was no debris on those mesial canals. So I'm kind of like, hmm, I wonder how large that apical portion is on the mesial of an extracted tooth and I'll put it up here where we were working on it and the one of the canals the portal of exit I think it was the mesial actually as well was huge I could take I think it was a 50 file all the way down so barely get it to get any type of apical stop and that's what we're looking for so although probably controversial when you're watching this really what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a predictable result now could I have had a predictable result with a 3506 maybe I'm not sure. Hard to say. So we're going to do lots of irrigation. We're going to make sure that when we're irrigating. Now this video really talks, I really wanted to do a whole video on irrigation, but even as I was thinking about it, it was like super boring. Let me just go ahead and walk, go slowly kind of through the irrigation process. So we're irrigating until the irrigant is clear coming out of the, coming out of the canal. So here again is our cleaned and shaped, our mesial buckle or mesiolingual, and this right here, see this little dot right there? That little dot, I was kind of thinking like, hmm. Another efficiency way to increase your efficiency and confidence, especially in irrigating, is bending your needle. Your, I've measured it about two millimeters short of my working length. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we've, we're going to activate our sodium hypochlorite. I'm gonna activate it with my sonic activator. And really the intent, and the way I visualize this in my mind is like baking a cake. You can't just take all your ingredients and put it 
put it into your bowl and expect it to make itself. It needs to be mixed up. And that's kind of the way I think about irrigation is like, we're baking that cake. Mind you, it's not, this cake is not going to taste very good. But the cake we're trying to, what we're trying to do is, you know, stir up all that debris at the apical part. Because So when we're rinsing with EDTA, what I will do is I'll try to take my irrigating needle a little bit closer to the apical portion because I'm less fearful of having some sort of accident with EDTA. So what it's trying to do is trying to push coronally all of that debris. So what we're going to do is I'm going to bend. I'm not bending, but I'm actually pushing towards the middle of the tooth from each side of that orifice and from each side of the distal canal so I'm kind of using the side of the of the you know the opposite side of that file to kind of remove some of that isthmus in the middle of that tooth I'm sorry I, I skipped ahead and that's really one of the things I wanted to show you is that that's one technique you know you can pull out your ultrasonics and try to remove that isthmus absolutely this is one technique I've been using for quite a while and I find it's fairly predictable and just kind of using the side to cut to remove any type of isthmus, debris or whatnot. And we're going to do that again, actually, when we're addressing the medial mesial canal. So let me just irrigate all of that debris. And let's pull out the distal. There you go. So you can see here's where, you know, this is where that isthmus is. So I'm using that file to kind of push mesially a little bit and push a little bit mes or to the middle of the tooth, if you may, not mesially push to the middle of the tooth just to kind of remove some of that isthmus to get better visualization and be able to obturate a little bit cleaner. Okay, so here we are. So let's go ahead and fit some cones. Now what's going through my mind is I need to confirm with certainty that the mesial canal is joined. Now I don't, I have an indirect indicator, you know, doing the, you know, aspirating my irrigant or suctioning out the irrigant with my irrigating syringe. However, I don't have exact information. So let's go ahead and find that. And what's one way without a comium finding it? Well, what I can do, and here's another tip, just as I put this down, you don't, you can't see it on camera, but I take the, I place the cone, I pull it out and then I squeeze the cotton tip forceps tips. And you can see the gutta percha has this, you can like, there's no, it's not in focus, it's in focus here. You can see, like, there's no mistaking where am I working like this. And it actually looks a little bit short. So what I'm gonna do is that's in the mesial buckle. This is normally what I'll do is I'll place my file, I'll place a, a gutter percha in the mesial canal, because it's straighter. Then I'll take my file, run it down the mesial buckle. And what I'm trying to do is confirm that they join. And sure enough, you can see it'll become clear in one second right there. See that little groove right there? What that tells me, you can see it right there. Let me go really slow there. Get my pointer out of the way. Right there, that little groove indicates to me that those canals join or confluent. So I'm like, okay, perfect. You can see it right there, right at the bottom. What I've learned over time is that there might be, I've seen some failures in cases that join because there's vital tissue that remains underneath in the isthmus where those cases, where they join. It's, and if you do them in one, one stage you'd, and you'd never know, there might be an opportunity for that debris, to, the vital tissue to continue to be there. And that's really one of the impetus for me opening the case to a 4505, but also right there, those little snake eyes right there. Boom. And those little guys right there, that kind of leads me to think like, hmm, I wonder if there's a middle mesial that has more tissue that may be providing that sensory and sensation from cold to hot for this patient. This has been very helpful actually using forceps to place files because then I can see my mirror through my mirror I can see what's going on. This is a number three mirror and it's a lot smaller than the standard number five size. Two is even better but for some reason I can't get my hands on two right now so number three is the best that I can get my hands on. So I was able to get a stick in the mesial lingual version of that. So I'm gonna watch mine to file down, but this can be really tedious. And the problem that I'm experiencing is that the file is too long. So at this moment, what I routinely do, I've been doing this for 10 years, is ask my dental assistant, can you grab some short files? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take actually my primary and see if I can get some traction, just to kind of orifice open. You got to be really careful when you're doing this because, again, this can ledge. 
This is a file, brand new file. You actually have not seen me use this in this case. So it's a brand, it hasn't been used. It's been, it's, we have it out, but it's been brand new. So I don't want to fracture that file. And look at the other thing I'm doing is, this is something that I've been doing. You know, let me know if it's, it's helpful. I'll do this, especially where there's for, not for cations, but middle mesials. I'll actually use the cutting, again, just like the this, I'll use the side cutting of the file. I don't really like using ultrasonics. I'll use them. I have used them. I have them. I don't like routinely using them. It's just another thing to have out. But what I will use is the side cutting version of this, of the file, just to kind of get it in there and clean up, you know, see if I can open an orifice or whatnot. I find it's very helpful just to get in detailed little places. And it's simple. And if it does fracture, this again, this is a brand new file. It's going to fracture. Let me go back here. It's going to fracture right, usually right around there. It's never fractured, but if it does, like a gate's glidden, then I can just kind of pull it out. So what that allows me to do is kind of kind of remove in a little bit of this area right here. And I share this because if you're in a general practice, you know, having an ultrasonic is just another thing to have in, you know, just to have it ha to get out at that moment. So, you know, it's just another little tip you can use to be like, hey, listen, let me, I saw this guy try it. It's fairly safe to use. I couldn't. So what we're going to do now is we're going to see the cotton forceps are really helpful, but the 25 millimeter files are not. So what the next, if I recall, the next series of files you're going to see, we're going to skip down to the 6810 technique, which my buddy Les taught me. It's absolutely incredible. So if you don't know what that is, you can check us out at allthingsendo.ca. We talk about the 6810 technique. It has helped so many students get down things. You're going to watch it here as well. But if you're looking for a system-based course, like I know what it's like to be blocked out, ledged, everything, you name it, thousands of cases and frustration. So I took, what I wanted to do really is take all of these learnings, put them in a modular course, and we actually have, I'm working on an advanced course, which talks about perforations, retreats, post removal, metal post removal, fiber post removal, you know, if you made it to this point in the video, I'm super grateful. Like this stuff is not that stimulating. So I'm grateful you're here. Hopefully this helps. If you're looking for another advanced technique course, it's, I've had it out for a year now. It's called the MB2 Hunters course. It is strictly for MB2s and it goes through 10 cases. I'm really happy with the course because it can, it'll take, it'll take kind of the, the knowledge that I've had of struggle, literally struggle to find MB2s and kind of present them to you in a case-by-case -case scenario we go through. It's all cases. There's no very limited PowerPoints. I think I made one because I don't. So what we've done now is continuing down this road. So we're going to go to an eight. I thought it was going to a six, but we're going to an eight. And in this file system, the brands that we use, I think they're Lexicon. The stoppers for 21 millimeter files are white. So this is a 21 millimeter files using the cotton forceps to place it in that little spot is really helpful. And now I'm just going to watch mine. One of the things that has crossed my mind as I've watched this, this is the second time I've watched it since I recut this a little, many years ago, was I could have used the M4 handpiece. That would have been really helpful. It's a reciprocating handpiece. So we're using 21 millimeter files and it's so much easier to place it in the canal with cotton forceps. You can see exactly what you're doing. There is a bit of a learning curve because we are actually going direct to indirect on the mandible. So it's a little bit, a little bit different, a little bit fishy, a little bit squirrely. But there, I put up a video that talks about maybe pra one way I think about practicing for indirect vision because it is hard to do like indirect vision when you're starting off. But it's so helpful to use cotton forceps. So let me know, give it a shot your next time using cotton forceps, placing your files in, especially molars. Let me know if it helps. It's taken a while for me to get used to it, but man, it's made it's made such a significant difference. Um, you have to pre-curve your files just a little bit to help kind of get them in there, and then boom, down they go like that. So one of the things I was hoping to try to get some filing and watch winding with my cotton forceps so you could see what's going on with the file, but it's impossible. So here are my fingers. But one of the things that I'm feeling is the drop into kind of where that common orifice is and I feel it with the eight like it it's not the eight file or the six file is not going all the way it's not watch winding all the way down tight binding 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 all the way down it's like it it binds and all of a sudden boom it releases and then I'm like okay I think I'm into where 
that common place is, a common connection between the, the confluence, if you may. So that file kind of goes all the way down. Remember, the working length is roughly about 18 millimeters, so it's doing some smoothies. Doing smoothies, it's really smooth all the way down. So I'm like, okay, that is a great sign. We're gonna take our apex locator, check it, and yeah, we're set. So what I've, another article, what I'll do is I'll put it in the description box below or in the comments that talks about the idea about cleaning and shaping these because it's one thing to find them, then it's another kind of concept to be like, how do I not strip perf these? Because this is kind of where that, you know, you get really thinning, I don't know what the word is, thinning on the, on the inside of the root, if you may, on the distal aspect of the, of the mesial root, it gets really thin. And there's a possibility of strip perfing. So what we'll do is they talk about, I think a 2504 in those cases, in the, I can't remember if it's finite elemental analysis or just actually teeth they did. But what I'm gonna do based on that information, normally I'd open these to a 2507, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it to a 2007. So just the wave and gold small. And I'm doing that because I don't want to strip perf, but I also anticipate that it's all going to be confluent, and that's fairly common with all of these. So we're just going to use our 20, 2007 wave and gold small all the way to length. And then we're going to check on the mesial buckle to see if there's the other ones there. Now, what I can tell you is that I'm grateful because we removed that patient sensitivity to hot and cold, it was great, or the transition, so it's very helpful. So, you know, the question I have in endo, and if, I don't think we'll ever be able to answer it, was it the middle mesial? Was it removing all that pulpal tissue from the apical portion? Was it obturating? I don't know, all of, you know, what do you think? It's so interesting, all of this endo stuff, um, because, you know, the last thing you want is for, and Put in the comment. I know I've had it myself. Patient, you finish the endo, it's a great endo, and they still have cold or hot sensitivity or just some sort of weird feeling. And then you have to kind of troubleshoot and think like, hmm, is it cracked? Is it perio? Is it a missed canal? Is it still apical tissue? And maybe that's one of the issues that I have that I've seen time and time again is just that the apical portion might not be opened up large enough because um, you know, in a lot of what we see online is one file, super small, gentle wave, will solve the problem. But unfortunately, we still, if you watch, what's really interesting, if you watch Stephen Buchanan's video about irrigation, you know, let me know what you think. It's, uh, I'd really appreciate some sort of feedback to see what you think. So we're going to try the his we're going to try Dr. Buchanan's pulp sucker and we'll see how it goes. I think it's going to be complicated to use, but you never know. And it's certainly cheaper than a gentle wave. And that's where my confusion is because I've had such great success with just old school positive pressure. So what I'm doing here is you can see I've been trying to fiddle around and try to get into that mesial buckle. I am unsuccessful to get down it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to call it and then We'll tell the patient we found an extra tunnel. That's what I call them and say, hey, listen, we found an extra tunnel. That might have been the problem. It might not have been. If there is, if it's continued, the problem, you know, your sensation continues, what we'll do is we'll grab a 3D image and then we'll follow up and see, you know, what are the next options. Probably the next option would be to retreat those measles and see if we can find it after we take the cone beam. So the clinical symptoms are really important, not just, you know, unfortunately, um, we rely on a lot of digital, my experience has been we rely on a lot of digital imagery, but sometimes it doesn't tell the whole story because you'll see some things where you're like, wow, that doesn't, that should not work, but it does, <laughs> right? You've got this crazy, beautiful endo, and yet the patient still has symptoms. And you've got, then you have a, not, a, you know, not a poor endo, but one that you're like, wow, that should not work, and they work. And we, all know, we know that as cognitive dissonance. So we're going to finish your irrigation. And you know, at this point, I'm super stoked we've got that mesial, middle mesial. I was so excited. I know it's, it's weird, but so here we go. Let me just put this in slow speed here. So there it is there. 
or middle mesial, one of, but you know, it really looks like there should be kind of an isthmus here, but maybe we just got enough, uh, just got enough of that tissue out of there. So what we're going to do is let's move on to obturation. And one of the things I wanted to talk about, not so much obturation in this sense, but it was really had to do with tug back, positive tug back. And even my students in our course, we talk about positive tug back. And I might as well, and I just saw a message on our private Facebook group, literally the second private Facebook group talking about having positive tug back. Now, the thing is, is that I don't really, I've talked about to a lot of endodontists about this, and I was trained to have not tug, I was trained with tug back, but I never understood it, still don't understand it, and I'll never, not that I'll never use it again, but I really focus on the apical stop preparation, and that's kind of why I opened up the mesials to a larger, one of two reasons. One, to get rid of as much tissue as possible, vital tissue, to, to create a positive stop at the apical portion, just like a toilet bowl. If you don't know what I'm talking about, put it in the comments below. You've made it this far in the video, so I'm super excited you're still here. But it, creating an apical stop for my gutta percha, because we're not so worried about the, I'm more worried about the my gutta percha going too far apically. Look at that, isn't that such a sweet picture? Oh my gosh, look at that, hallelujah. That is just heaven right there. So we're not so much worried about my gutta percha coming out. I am, but I'm more worried about it going apically, especially when I put pressure on it. Yes, I'm using a single cone technique, and there is that isthmus. We removed it. So the be the benefit of using that, of removing kind of that apical por the coronal portion of the calcification is I can see right all the way down that, yeah, I've gotten rid of all that vital tissue. There's nothing remaining, no little strands or anything like that. And using that file, the you know, it didn't work out that well, but the idea is to be able to kind of remove, I, I could go back and go back and forth, remove it until it's, you know, back and forth, but I felt this was sufficient enough. Let's go right at that angle right there. You know, so we can see all, all pretty much to the canal curves. So the idea is really the apical stop preparations to prevent your gutta percha cones from flying out the end into the apical tissues, and then you have more of a problem rather than it coming out. So, especially, you know, I think, well, I, I know, well, I've been taught, how about that, that the idea of, so here we go, we'll just, I'm going to talk over, you know, the reason, my reasoning for using single, not so much single cone technique, but apical stop, is that when I go to place my cone in, I know it stops, and when I take my cone fit radiograph, probably the most important radiograph of all of them, I'll place sealer, place our cones, take my radiograph, and then when I go to sear off my cones, I know that they're not going to move. So I have confidence that my final radiograph after we place our restoration is going to be exactly the same as my cone fit. Maybe there'll be another puff or two. I'm not too worried about those, but that will be the difference. With the, the reason, you know, what I've been taught, the reason why we have you know, tug back was really for the thermoplastic technique that was taught by Schilder. But the idea is that when you place your, when you go to burn off your cone and start apically at the apical portion, we want to, you know, we want to remove gutta percha all the way down to our apical five, five millimeters, what I've taught, even three millimeters. We don't want that gutta percha to come out, you know, with the heat. And you, I mean, they come out with this technique, the single, with single cone technique as well. But I did thermoplastic technique for 10 years and it was the most frustrating thing ever. But I needed tuck back to make sure that my gutta percha cone wouldn't come back as I heated it down the canal. But I've also had cones go flying out the end, which was frustrating. Oh, so what you're seeing, look at this. I didn't even, I forgot this even happened. So what you're seeing here, and I didn't know what the issue was, my gutta percha cone was not going all the way down to length. So I didn't know if perhaps the sealer dried quickly or there was a little bit of debris down there. I'm not sure, but what I'm, and I'm looking to see if there's any debris in here. I, it's hard to tell because it's mixed with white. Everything's been disinfected. I'm not too concerned about having biofilm or whatnot. So what I'm gonna do, and remember, I think what had happened was, wow, this is, a, this is kind of an advanced tip. So hopefully I don't, I'm gonna, I, I really wanna share this piece. I didn't even know it was in here. I think what had happened was, when I was instrumenting the middle mesial, potentially some debris had gone over to the 
mesial buckle, perhaps, and cause my cone not to go all the way down. Now, what that pause, and I now I, I and this is common for me to do, that pause that we were watching was me getting a fresh cone, measuring it off at 18 millimeters, and then placing it to length. And the reason why is those some of those bent cones are really hard to put in. So I'll take a fresh one, knowing that the cones are fairly predictable in their dimensions, even though there's a, a difference of about 10%, I find that with these dense ply wavelength gold cones, they're fairly, fairly consistent. And then we'll place our middle mesial. So that's kind of why I did that. I mean, is it against the rules? No, not at all. All that debris has been sitting down in, in sort of the core for a while, down at the apical portion, that should be pointed down here, down at the apical portion. So what you saw was my cone wouldn't go to length. I believe there was some debris at the apical portion. Already had sealer down, so I'm like, you know what, let's just continue our path down the down to the end of the road here and keep going. And we're just going to place our GP cones in the distal canal. Wow, that one caught me by surprise, actually. <laughs> I'm thinking at this moment, like when I review this edit, I wonder if I'm going to keep it in there. Okay, we'll place our other cone. It's not going to go fully to length because they join. Let's go ahead and take that radiograph. There we are. So we take the radiograph. And then we're going to sear cones. And, you know, I really need to shout out to Dr. Ali Nassay. It's been, it's because of him I felt comfortable actually starting to post endo videos with single cone technique. Because the thermoplastic or even the continuous condensation technique, oh my gosh, it was so painful. Actually, as well, in the reach, so it, I was going to name in the retreat course, you've made it to this point, so I might as well you know, watch, you know, let the real cat out of the bag. It was going to be a retreat course, but I thought, like, there's so many other things involved in retreatment than just retreatment. There's other advanced things, like removing thermophil carriers. Those can be quite frustrating to remove. So, they, yes, they are part of retreatment, but it's more advanced technique. So, that's in there as well. So we're just going to place, so when I place that apical pressure on extracted teeth, it's really hard to move a whole gutta percha cone. If you've tried it, and I'd, I'd ask that you try it, especially on extracted teeth, it's so hard to remove, to push that apical, the whole cone any further. But it's possible, but what we're trying to do, anticipate with the apical stop, is to prevent any, we're making a little ledge, the apical portion, and trying to prevent any type of apical motion. So then what we'll do is we're going to, like Dr. Nassay says, we just kind of burnish the gutta purchase, seal it off the coronal portion. That isthmus is going to cause a little bit of grief. I can't remember what's going to happen. What I do do is I just place our dental chairs are in a closed system, so they're, it's distilled water, so it's not open. So I, I did throw around the idea. I did try using, so there we go. After that, I did try using sodium epic chloride to remove this BCC there, but it was so frustrating. And what I think you can do, because there were questions before about how do you remove this? How do you remove the BCC there? I just take my air water syringe, I place, press both buttons and spray like crazy. You could take hypochlorite after this and rinse it out if you feel uncomfortable about leaving that. Um, that is an option. Again, I've been using this, I've been doing this technique for over 10 years now. And I've had some great success, and I'm super grateful for all. The, and the reason I think I've had success is because I've had some great teachers over the way, over along the years. So what we're going to do is we're going to etch and bond, and then we'll place our restoration. And this patient is next. It's been a long time. I can't recall either. It was a crown or an onlay that was going to be placed. Anyways, I'm so grateful you're here. Like absolutely. Absolutely grateful. I'm super grateful you made it to the end. Let me know if you made it to the end. Put in the comments below. Hopefully this is helpful, and um, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.